good to have four of the key authors with us today. And um, I will do my best to, to continue integrating your questions on, on Mentimeter. If you have a very urgent question that I haven't addressed, there are always women in the corner, and you can ask them to um, sneak me a note if, uh, if need be. So we are going to try to unpack the findings of this new special report by the IPCC on um, the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees and uh, what that science tells humanitarians about the changing risks today and in the future. I'm going to start by passing the floor to uh, Dr. Valérie Masson-Delmotte. Sorry. She's one of the co-chairs of the IPCC Working Group on Physical Science. She's based at the uh, Université Paris-Saclay and is the research director at the French Alternative Energies and Atomic Energy Commission, where she works in the Climate and Environment Sciences Laboratory. Wow. Uh, Valérie, please, an overview of the findings. Thank you very much. And I would like to have the first slide on the screen, please. So um, Dr. Abdallah Moxit has already introduced the context of the preparation of this report and the key messages. And I would like, uh, in the spirit of the Taranoa Dialogue, to share my story with you. So I've mapped, basically, key findings of the report to the questions of the Taranoa Dialogue. Next slide, please. So my story is the story of scientists picking up the invitation from COP21, publishing six southern studies, which are at the heart of the assessment. My story is the dedication of 91 lead authors and review editors from 40 nations, half of them from the global north, half of them from the global south, and the inputs of 133 contributing authors who have worked as much as they could on a volunteer basis during the last 19 months. So they have assessed these 6,000 studies. They have addressed more than 42,000 review comments on successive drafts of the reports provided by more than a thousand expert reviewers and governments. And it's an unprecedented, unprecedented collective endeavor that leads to the key findings I'm going to share with you now. Next slide, please. Where are we now? We know that since pre-industrial times, human activities have caused about one degree of global warming with a likely range between 0.8 and 1.2 degrees Celsius. Could I have the next slide, please? OK, I can go on. <laughs> and we already see the impact of this degree of global warming. It's affecting extreme weather. It's affecting sea level rise, diminishing Arctic sea ice. And so the first key message from this report is that climate change is already affecting people ecosystems and livelihoods all around the world. If the world continues to warm at this current rate, global temperature is likely to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius between 2030 and 2052. We will very quickly enter in a 1.5 degree warmer world. And the final message about where are we is that past emissions from pre-industrial times to the present will continue to cause changes in the climate system, but these past emissions alone are unlikely to cause warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius or more. It all depends on emissions to come from now onwards. Next slide, please. The second element of the report is looking at the impact associated with a global warming of 1.5 or 2 degrees and the avoided risks associated with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. It also means looking at the implications of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and emissions of compounds which also affect air quality. Next slide, please. Let me stop now. Who of you has read our 30-page summary for policymakers in this room? Thank you very much. So, as a, as a teaser for those of you who have not yet done it, I show examples of the figures. You know, scientists like to communicate with figures and summary in words as well. And you can find what you best like. So, the second part of, of the key findings are related to the avoided risks 
associated with stabilizing global warming at 1.5 compared to 2 degrees Celsius. And there are very strong findings from science. Models project robust differences in climate between present day and global warming of 1.5 and between 1.5 and 2 degrees. Half a degree matters. These differences include the level of mean warming over land and in the oceans, hot extremes where people live, heavy rainfall in several regions, and the probability of drought in some regions. Global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius means 10 centimeters less sea level rise by 2100, and more time for adapting to sea level rise. Fewer people exposed to the risks of rising seas. It also means, next slide please, a reduced risk of loss of terrestrial biodiversity and species extinction, about twice lower with global warming of 1.5 compared to 2 degrees. In oceans, even at 1.5 degrees Celsius, 70 to 90% of warm water coral reefs are at risk of severe degradation. It would be 99% or more at 2 degrees of global warming. It's important for the beauty of the world. It's also important for the services to people. Coral reefs offer coastal protection, resources for food and through fisheries, and resources through tourism activities. Limiting warming to 1.5 compared to 2 degrees would mean smaller reductions in yields of maize, rice, wheat, and potentially other crops, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, Central and South America. It's important for food security. It's also important for water security. And the increase in the proportion of the world population exposed to climate change induced water shortages would be half smaller at 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to 2 degrees. It's also important with respect to risks to fisheries and livelihoods which depend on fisheries. Altogether, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees compared to 2 degrees could reduce the number of people exposed to climate-related risks, as well as susceptible to poverty, by up to several hundred million by 2050. Next slide, please. You can see here a summary of key risks with the classical IPCC reasons for concerns. And you can see the shift from moderate to high or very high risk between today and two degrees of global warming. Each half a degree matters with respect to climate risks. Next slide, please. Let's now move to where do we want to go and how to get there. Next, please. To limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, it's not geophysically impossible, but it implies very fast reductions in emissions of greenhouse gases. For carbon dioxide emissions, 45% less by 2030 compared to the levels of 2010. It implies that global emissions of carbon dioxide would need to reach net zero by 2050. This means that human activities do not emit more into the atmosphere than we are able to extract from the atmosphere and store in a sustainable way. It's the same type of transitions as for limiting warming to two degrees, but they have to happen really faster. As part of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, reducing emissions of substances other than carbon dioxide that affect climate and air quality would have direct and immediate public health benefits as well, especially in cities. Limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, it implies changes on an unprecedented scale. It means deep emission reductions in all sectors, the use of a wide range of technologies. Everyone can act in a daily life through behavioral changes and reorientation of investments towards low carbon options. It implies systems transitions for energy, land, cities, infrastructure, and industry. Next slide, please. Rapid progress is already being made in some areas, for instance, renewable energy, electricity storage, 
But this progress would need to be picked up in other sectors, such as transport and land management. To limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we need to be able to start extracting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and do it along the course of this century. Methods for doing this include restoring degraded lands, enhancing storage of carbon in soils, potentially reforestation and bioenergy combined with carbon dioxide capture and storage. Carbon dioxide removal on a large scale may have implications for food security, ecosystems, and biodiversity as well. Next slide, please. A key message from the assessment in this report is that pledges that government made over the last three years within the Paris Agreement are not on track, and they are not enough to keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius, even with the most ambitious and challenging efforts after 2030. Carbon dioxide emissions would need to decline substantially before 2030 to avoid warming of more than 1.5 degrees in the middle of the 21st century, followed by large-scale carbon dioxide removal. Next slide, please. You can see in blue that early action is needed if you want to avoid overshoot by several tenths of a degree above 1.5 degrees Celsius and reliance on large-scale carbon dioxide removal. So basically, we are facing three main risks. The first one is the risk of entering into this unknown territory and overshooting 1.5 degrees Celsius. The second risk is reliance on unproven technologies to extract and store carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. The third risk is an unprecedented transition in all systems. But we know how to act. Next slide, please. With respect to acting before 2030, it's very clear that each year matters. Next, please. How do we get there? There are potential synergies and trade-offs between the impacts of global warming and the responses to global warming with sustainable development goals. There are options for ethical and fair transitions shielding the poor and vulnerable. As part of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, a mix of measures to adapt to climate change and options to reduce emissions will, if carefully selected, have benefits for meeting the sustainable development goals. And the last key message is, each choice matters. So to conclude, we highlight how much half a degree matters how much each year matters, each year of action, as well as each year of inaction, and how much each choice matters, especially for the most vulnerable people and the most vulnerable ecosystems. It's not a report about hope or despair. It's a report about knowledge for action and a report about courage and political will. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria, and I was uh, struck in some of the discussions yesterday um, when some of us were gathered around how uncontroversial actually the findings of the report were. And it, in a similar report several years ago, you would have had many more people attacking the science, and today um, those skeptics are at least not quite as loud. And so there's a certain progress, I think, that we can take away from that. And I was also quite struck by the fact that you went to such lengths not to simply say it's going to be worse at 1.5 degrees, but to really put numbers on it to say, you know, 60 million more people will be affected by drought and so on, that, that um, as a journalist at least, really takes the narrative forward. I'd like to turn now to Dr. Deborah Roberts, who is another co-chair of um, IPCC Working Group 2. Um, which looks at the impacts uh, at adaptation and at the vulnerabilities of, of climate change. She's based in uh, Durban, South Africa, and uh, established and heads up the Environmental Planning and Climate Protection Department of um, the municipality that I cannot pronounce. <laughs> Deborah, go ahead. <laughs> um, she is the, the first resilience <laughs> officer of Go on. Each Queenie municipality. There you go. Um, so, Deborah, please, uh, what does the report tell us about adaptation? 
Good morning, everyone. And it sounds like there's a plethora of coaches. There's another coach here. It sounds like they've, <laughs> they've mass produced us, but good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, I think we've heard some very powerful messages today. And, and the one that really struck me was from the Executive Secretary of the IFRC, which stressed that in the current world, we've got to engage with a, a mix of politics and science and activism and response. And so what I hope to do is start off by looking at the politics and science of the original invitation, because I think it provides us with a roadmap to the activism and response that is important in the field of adaptation. And I think that's important because we heard Valerie stress the need for accelerated mitigation, perhaps a less emphasized message that comes from the report is the need to accelerate adaptation as well. So I hope to shine a light into that. Next slide, please. As, as our secretary indicated this morning, this original invitation came from the very busy negotiating halls in Paris in 2015. And that invitation really focused in on the impacts of 1.5 and the related emissions pathway. So very much a outreach to science from the policymakers around the issue of mitigation. Next slide, please. But the panel gathered in Nairobi to consider this invitation and applied its mind to the current state of the world and realized that while the initial invitation was an important one, that the context of this invitation also needed to be considered and that the assessment could only be balanced if that concern for ambitious mitigation, which has been stressed by every speaker today, was considered within the framework of understanding the threats that emerge from climate change, the opportunities and challenges of sustainable development, and really critically, the efforts to eradicate poverty. We all know about the SDGs and the fact that our development mantra now is leave no one behind. And that certainly has to be the greatest humanitarian call I've ever heard, leave no one behind. So it's within that context that the invitation was in fact expanded by the panel to allow us to consider a more balanced assessment. And that allowed us, next slide please, to introduce this notion of climate resilient development pathways, which really speak to us about a broader concern, not only about greenhouse gases that people can't see, but the fact that we must be talking about development paths that are sustainable at all scales, not only international and national, but right down to the local. And we've heard that plea today. The local voices need to be heard more strongly about the need to eradicate poverty, but to do that in an equitable way through these vast transitions that we now all have to become champions of. And obviously, to reduce the threat of climate change, not only through ambitious mitigation, which is the strong focus of the report, and indeed will be the strong focus of the Telenoa Dialogue and COP24, but importantly, adaptation and climate resilience. So this consideration by the panel allowed us to widen that original invitation to allow this more balanced assessment by the many scientists that Valerie has called out. Next slide, please. So what does this particularly colorful report tell us? And there's been a lot of Twitter feed on what does this picture actually mean? I'll leave you to ponder that. Next slide, please. <laughs> what I will give you some insight to is not the colorful nature of the cover, but how this understanding of the risks and impacts that lie in our future give us a sense of the scale of adaptation that is necessary. Next slide, please. The biggest message, and again, it was stressed by the Executive Secretary of IFRC this morning, I wonder if it's because we both come from Africa that we think the same way and read the report in the same way, um, that ambitious mitigation is the surest and best form of adaptation. Because with ambitious mitigation, you re remove the need to adapt and the difficulties and the costs associated with that. And as we heard from the representative of the Marshall Islands today, for many people around the world, that level of ad adaptation simply will not be possible. So the important message is by mitigating, we are also adapting. Next slide, please. And that's really important. Valerie showed the first half of this particular diagram. What this figure shows us, and this is an extension of the now famous burning embers diagram, is that we, when we look across a range of natural managed and human systems, as we push global average temperature higher, so the risks and impacts we are going to experience in these systems are going to increase, it's going to make adaptation all that much more difficult for us. Next slide, please. 
Valerie's already gone through some of these, and I see, oh, this is an interesting reconfiguration of this slide, um, <laughs> has gone through some of these. But the point that she made is that half a degree matters. The world is very different in 1.5 compared to what it would be at two degrees. And just to recap some of those, if we think about sea level rise, a very important consideration because the majority of us are now living in coastal areas. If we stick to 1.5 degrees, that means sea level rise will be 10 centimeters lower, um, although it will continue to rise for centuries thereafter. That means 10 million people exposed to less risk from rising seas. Absolutely critical because so many people, so much of our infrastructure lies in our coastal areas. We'll see that water, which we know is a confounding factor in terms of sustainable development. In a 1.5 degree uh, world, we'll find that global population we're exposed to increased water shortages will be up to 50% less, so a significant uh, drop in that level of exposure. We also see lower risks for human health through heat-related morbidity and mortality, ozone-related mortality, vector-borne diseases, and through the reduction of non-CO2 emissions. Next slide, please. We'll also see, and this is a point that Valerie stressed, and I think it bears repeating, that several hundred million people, so several hundred million people around the world, will be uh, exposed to less climate risk and less susceptible to poverty. And again, that's an important humanitarian call because the SDGs call on us to leave no one behind. And poverty means that people are left behind. Importantly for decision makers, there's a lower risk to global aggregated economic growth. And certainly our adaptation needs will be low with less pronounced limits to adaptive capacity and less associated loss in a world of 1.5 degree C of global warming. Next slide, please. So the question is, if we know that these risks and impacts lie ahead of us, we know that we can reduce them through ambitious mitigation, what should be our global adaptation response? Next slide, please. Valerie has already pointed out, and for me, as someone who works on a day-to-day -day basis in a local government in Africa, I need a very clear roadmap about the decisions I'm going to take and where I'm going to put local resources. And so for me, this is a particularly powerful message. It gives us our roadmap for action. These four big system transitions that are absolutely essential in terms of energy, land, urban, and infrastructure, and industry are a strong call out for ambitious mitigation, but they are equally a strong call out for ambitious and accelerated adaptation. Because while these systems hold huge potential for bending the curve, they are also extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And so that synergy between adaptation and mitigation in these transitions is something we must not lose sight of. Next slide, please. So how do we respond to climate change as policymakers, as people working in various aspects of sustainable development? We need to know that we can't just bend the curve on mitigation alone. We have to accelerate adaptation as well. And it's not a simple silver bullet. There are synergies, certainly, in bringing those agendas together, but there are also very real trade-offs. So there are difficult decisions to be made ahead. We also need to know that adaptation has to be contextually appropriate. And if it is, if we respond to the local calls of local people around local needs, that will have very real benefits for sustainable development, give us a greater chance of leaving no one, no space, and no ecosystem behind. But again, there are trade-offs. You know, you can restore forests to improve the ability to um, enhance water catchment, but if you remove people from the land that they've been on for centuries, that's a real barrier to sustainable development. We also present in the report the fact that adaptation has to be facilitated by a range of enabling conditions. Uh, next slide, please. And something you don't see in the summary for policymakers and you won't be able to read here, but I urge you to direct yourself to the main report after you've gone through the summary for policymakers, is a very innovative feasibility assessment for mitigation and adaptation presented by our authors, looking at a range of enabling conditions, economic, technological, institutional, social, cultural, environmental, and geophysical, looking at providing clearer direction on what that roadmap looks like. Um, next slide, please. Where the dark shading indicates there's an absence of barriers. So these are things we can pick up almost immediately. The moderate indicates no positive or negative effect. The light shading indicates blocking barriers, so things that would be more difficult. And where we see white insufficient literature. Next slide, please. So I urge you to look at these feasibility tables for those of you interested in action, because they give us a sense of where our low-hanging fruit for action will be. Next slide, please. 
We also need to acknowledge, as several speakers have indicated, that these system transitions are going to come for a cost, are going to come at a cost. Nothing comes for free today. But how are we going to achieve that redirection of investment into not only ambitious uh, mitigation, but also accelerated adaptation? And certainly, um, that consideration of system transitions and increased investment are going to be important in terms of harnessing the opportunity of existing policy instrument, instruments, um, reaping the benefits of accelerated technological innovation and encouraging behavior change. We also need to acknowledge that climate response doesn't happen independent of our overall development needs. And the report reiterates a very important message that I think many people forget, that this increased investment also needs to focus on increased investment in basic infrastructure, in physical and social infrastructure, because that is one of the key ways of enhancing our resilience and adaptive capacity. You cannot separate development and adaptation in the real world. That is a really important message to take out when we consider funding, and particularly important when we look at the summary for policymakers, which calls out the most vulnerable places in the world, Asia, Africa, and South America. Adaptation finance was harder to put a metric to or an amount to. We were able to do that for mitigation. We were less able to do that uh, with adaptation finance, so an important knowledge gap that needs to be filled. Next slide, please. We also know that governments have to be proactive in lowering the risk of investment in adaptation, which is always seen as a public good and not seen as a place where private investment um, can play a role. But certainly, government policies can help draw in private funds and enhance the effectiveness of public policies more generally. A point that's been mentioned by everyone, there is no room for complacency. Every single institution, every single individual, every single community, every single country, every single UN body has to put their shoulder to the wheel on this if we are to receive or to achieve these dramatic changes. And certainly the international cooperation we see in this room here today is a critical part of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Next slide, please. I leave with a, a strong message because as a a practitioner, I need to know where to act. And for me, one of the strongest messages, which comes from this very confused slide, um, is that one of our low-hanging fruit lie in the world's cities. We are urbanizing at the fastest rate in human history. Cities provide us with the opportunity to act at the front line of adaptation and mitigation. And so I would urge you to look at opportunities in cities, particularly coastal cities around the world, to begin this enormous push to bend the curve not only on accelerating adaptation, but obviously also um, increasing the world's level of ambitious mitigation. Thanks very much. Before turning to the next speaker, I just want to, to uh, better understand a little bit, Deborah, because you've, you, you've highlighted a fair bit, and I think this is a rather new emphasis to be linking the adaptation agenda with the development, the wider development agenda, and specifically the SDGs. Is that a move? I know you, you don't want to be prescriptive, but are you doing that strategically to give this agenda a bit more oomph? And um, maybe the second piece of that, and you, you also mentioned that tension, how then do you suggest the wider community that is engaged on these issues navigate those tensions that sometimes doing what's best for climate adaptation is not what's best for development, um, which, how, how should the policy community manage that? It, so definitely the mantra of the IPCC is uh, policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. And certainly if I reflect back on the discussions that happened in Nairobi, a lot of the emphasis on broadening the invitation to include sustainable development was to ensure that in the assessment, that the scientists could look at the full range of options that were available to the governments. Um, and that was a very important opportunity to broaden that assessment so that the scientists could bring broader options, and that was the real reason. Sustainable development is now the framing context for the sustainable development goals, which is seen as the architecture for directing global development up until 2030. Um, and so it was important that whatever options we presented could be related back to that broader understanding of where development needs to take us over the next decades. So that was the, the reason for, for doing that. Um, in terms of the second question, yes, there will be trade-offs, but it's important not to take away a message that 
climate action works against development. There's a very real opportunity highlighted in the report through the transitions um, that are pinpointed to show how climate responses that are ambitious can be key factors in allowing us to achieve a more sustainable and equitable world. But it requires a new development path. Certainly the old development path uh, will directly headbutt against uh, climate action. But what we're calling out here is the opportunity of a new development path, which allows us to achieve equity, allows everyone at the table, allows everyone the access to well-being, and ensures a safe uh, climate. But that requires a, a new approach in its entirety. Thank you. Um, I just want to flag that we are going to, and I'm going to break the, the rules of the Mentimeter that hopefully at the end of this session just take some reactions from the floor because I do recognize that this is, um, you know, kind of two different worlds coming together and how we navigate that is, um, is going to be interesting and hearing a bit of feedback from you would be quite useful. So we'll get um, to hear a few more perspectives on the science and then turn to you. So I'm going to turn now to Miles Allen also a climate scientist, um, climate scientist um, but who has uh, played an important role in the field of attribution of extreme weather events to climate change and has been a big driver of the report overall. Um, he's also one of the coordinating lead authors um, of, of the chapter on uh, framing and context and is based at the University of Oxford where he leads the climate dynamics group. Thanks. Miles, I think as, as journalists, certainly we're always kind of wondering when you see these big storms or hurricanes or whatever, is this linked to climate change or not? And, and I think 10, 15 years ago, scientists were kind of wary of making those connections. Uh, that's shifting now. It certainly is. And that's actually one of the main uh, pieces of progress we've made, I think, as a scientific community over the past decade, was making the link between uh, global scale climate changes and the individual weather events that actually cause harm. I'm going to talk specifically about what this report has to say about extreme weather um, and uh, happy to take questions on individual weather events and where we're going on that. Um, I, I certainly haven't got a catalogue in my head, although I do know people who virtually have a postcode level uh, knowledge of individual weather events and the role of climate change within them. Um, but um, and, and actually, Martin Van Els is one of them. Um, but uh, So can we go to the first slide, please? Um, and uh, uh, I hope that's working. We, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, yeah, you'll have to click quite a lot, I'm afraid. So three clicks, thank you. Okay, so so um, Valerie's already mentioned. Um, you know, every additional half degree of warming has a significant impact on weather extremes. I'll show you some um, evidence of that uh, that was cited in this report. Um, we're at one degree. Um, we didn't have the evidence base to say this in the report, but I'm going to tell you it anyway because this is what we do. Um, we're warming faster than ever. These are unusual scientists we have with us today. Um, so, so um, and I hope, uh, and looking forward to AR6, I hope there will be some more research on how fast is human-induced warming proceeding at the moment. It's a really important question as we're approaching 1.5 degrees. As far as we can tell, we are warming faster than ever. So we're approaching a stop sign not very far away, and at the moment we are still accelerating. That's the situation. That's the reality. If it continues at the current rate, we're going to get to 1.5 degrees to somewhere between 2030 and 2050 or so, and we are seeing clear impacts on extreme high and low temperatures, on high precipitation, and on increased drought in some regions. And if we go to the next slide, we can talk about some of the evidence for this. Here's global, monthly global temperatures. Um, we showed you the monthly. Traditionally, the IPCC shows a series of annual temperatures, but that conceals the fact that there is obviously variability on top of that, and in March 2016, we actually hit 1.5 degrees for that month. It was a combination of human influence and the strong El Nino event that was happening that year, but we are starting to get into the territory where temperatures are wobbling up towards 1.5 degrees. So we're not, we, are, we are already that close. But this record gives us an opportunity as well. If you hit return, please. Um, we can place half a degree of warming into context, um, we've already seen significant changes in weather extremes between the period 1960 to 79 and the period 1991 to 2010, which are highlighted on this slide. And if you hit return, please, those are separated by half a degree of warming. So uh, somebody mentioned, um, was it Abdullah? 
Um, no, uh, putting the, uh, I've, I've lost my notes here, but um, putting um, a human context on half a degree. Well, for many audiences, it doesn't work for students, but for many audiences, perhaps it works a bit better for this audience, we can say that's the difference, well, for some of the people in this room, I should say, that's the difference between your childhood and your adulthood. And between your childhood and your adulthood, we had half a degree of warming, and if you go to the next slide, this is a little bit more technical, okay? But this shows you how the distribution of key indicators of weather extremes, high temperatures, hot, hot days, hot nights, high rainfall, the, the, the top three are all temperature indicators, the bottom two are rainfall and high rainfall indicators, and you can see how those distributions have changed shape, shifted to the right as a result of the uh, changes that occur just over that half a degree period. So we have seen a significant change in the risk of individual extreme weather events over that half a degree of warming. So we are seeing events that are being made substantially more likely as a result of the climate change to date. And this, of course, is continuing as every, with every additional half a degree. Next slide. One of the points we emphasized in this report is how variable climate change is across the world and how even at one degree of warming, which is where we're at now, already between 20 and 40% of the world's population live in regions that have warmed by more than one and a half degrees in at least one season of the year. When we say regions here, we mean very large scale regions. And actually an important knowledge gap, uh, which, we are, which many groups are now working on, is what is happening in cities. Deborah mentioned the importance of cities here. Cities amplify the large scale, that the existence of a large city amplifies the large scale warming trend and understanding how temperatures are are starting to run away where people live is becoming ever more important. Next slide, please. Uh, we've seen the, uh, the reasons for concern diagram. Just to remind you what these colors mean, yellow means we can see, we can detect a significant impact on this variable of climate change. And as you can see in the left one, hit return, please. Um, on the, in the, the extreme weather events, our, our reason for concern number two, uh, we are in the zone uh, where we can detect an inf uh, influence of large-scale events. And as we get towards 1.5 degrees, we're moving into the red zone, which indicates severe and widespread impacts and risks. Purple here, which you can see for unique and threatened systems on the right, um, which is starting to emerge at two degrees, means very high risks of severe impacts and potentially irreversible impacts. So one of the, uh, uh, one of the impacts called out there, uh, I'm, I'm moving off, off script here slightly because it's not about extreme weather events, but I think it's very important. Um, we are looking at coral reefs being irreversibly destroyed at, uh, at two degrees, whereas we may be able to still save them at one and a half. Next slide, please. Um, this shows you some of the underlying evidence going into that, and it shows you how these risks of, high ex of extreme weather events go up in different regions of the world um, for, for, for different, um, types of, different types of indicators um, and with additional degrees of warming. So the little numbers at the bottom there, 0, 1, 2, 3, those are degrees of warming. And if you hit return, please, um, that just highlights one of these many indicators we considered, which shows you how drought risk is increasing in the Mediterranean region. So the report was quite cautious about drought. We actually had a lot of discussions of drought last week, but we can only say things quite regionally specific on drought, but we can say that drought risk is increasing in the Mediterranean region, which of course is extremely important. Um, at the top, you can see uh, just another indicator, risk of extreme hot days uh, is going up pretty much everywhere, very consistently um, in, in many dif different regions. The regions here, by the way, are Amazonia, Central Europe, um, Central North America, East Asia, the Mediterranean, and Northern Europe, which is reading across from left to right. If we go to the next slide, um, this shows um, the, some of the impacts that have been documented of these changes um, in extreme weather. And picking out one which is a particular concern to many people, health impacts. This is not a figure from the report, but it's part of the evidence base cited in the report, um, showing the, how the net impact of climate changes um, are affecting b between 2 degrees and 1.5 degrees would impact both cold deaths and heat deaths. 
so deaths from extreme heat versus deaths from extreme cold um, in many different regions of the world. And you can see in the unfortunate southern Europe here, but also in Southeast Asia, um, we're seeing a prevalence of increased heat deaths over reduced cold deaths. So, so climate change has multiple impacts on health stresses, but the uh, heat deaths are outweighing the cold deaths um, in, in some regions of the world, not all. Um, and that's a really important point for us to understand better as we go forward, and I certainly hope there will be a more refined version of this figure with much lower error bars going into the sixth assessment report. Next slide, please. Finally, this report very importantly acknowledges some of the implications, and there's a lot of words on this. This is just a straight snapshot from the summary for policymakers, uh, but it's one um, that I I pulled out because actually this is the second outreach event I've done, and the first one was at the Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee a couple of days ago, um, where they are really focused on the conclusions of this report. And one of the conclusions they're particularly interested in is this one, if you hit return please, just to highlight the report acknowledges that there are limits to adaptation and adaptive capacity for some human and natural systems, even at a global warming of 1.5 degrees with associated losses. And one of the conversations I think that has to be starting in this room is, and, and among all of us, is there will be losses that they will be costing the humanitarian system addressing those losses, and ultimately we need to start a global conversation about who will end up paying. Next slide, please. Just to conclude, if you put them all up, thank you. Every, do, every half a degree matters. We are seeing some beneficial impacts, but the consequences are primarily negative. And as evidence of harm emerges, this is me putting in a little bit of uh, extra here, this is certainly not a conclusion in the report, but I think there's something which, is, something which is becoming clear in the scientific community, there's a growing need for a comprehensive and balanced inventory of impacts of anthropogenic climate change so we know what it's doing in different parts of the world to inform both the discussions of adaptation and ultimately, the discussion of addressing associated losses. That's lastly, it's sort of an appeal to you all to think about how can we place this impact inventory onto a more, onto a regular, um, objective footing so that in, in, in the successive cycles of this report, it's not just a matter of us going round and, and garnering what we can from the published literature, but, but taking a, 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 an, an official global inventory, just as we have a global inventory of emissions. We, we count very carefully how each country is contributing to this problem. For some reason, we don't count very carefully how each country is being affected by this problem. Why not? Whew. Apart from half a degree matters, how much of that went over people's heads? Just to get a sense. Are, are we following or is this like too deep in the science? I should no, apologize for my speed of speaking. I get excited. <laughs> um, I'm going to turn to Professor Daniela Jacob, who will be our last um, science speaker and is also a coordinating lead author of the chapter of the report that focuses on impacts on um, natural and human systems. Um, she is based in Germany, where she directs the country's Climate Service Center. And um, I think, uh, Daniela, you know, we've, we've all been talking about how we're now in a much more dramatic humanitarian landscape as a result of uh, what we're already seeing and, and what the report um, further exemplifies. What are the impacts um, in, in an even more granular level of the 1.5 degrees warming on, on human systems? Yeah, thank you very much for the inviting inviting me here and the words. It is a bit difficult now to talk to you about impacts because my three colleagues have already touched partly what I wanted to say and what is in the report. So I would like to probably rearrange a little bit what I wanted to say. So maybe we could have the first slide, please. I think it is very important that we acknowledge that we have already had impacts on organisms and ecosystems as well as human systems and well-being. And the report states this with high confidence. 
So whenever the report talks about impacts, we are talking about what has been observed in the past. Whenever we talk about risks, it is about what might come in the future, just for understanding and better interpretation of the words which we are using. I wanted to emphasize this here again. So when Miles showed you the warming of half degree in the last 50 years, we could experience changes in extreme weather events. Next slide, please. There are changes in extreme heat waves, in droughts, in heavy precipitations, but they are not unique and equal all over the world. They are very different in very different regions. And that makes it so different to be prepared for those. And of course, also future warming and the consequences of future warming will be very regionally different. So I think what is, has to be highlighted here is that we see already that we can be prepared for some, in some regions for what might come in the future because we, these regions already experienced heavy rain events, for example. What has not mentioned before is that in the report it is stated that the water, the rain amount which falls in tropical cyclones is increasing. It has increased in the past and it will increase in the future. So the risk of additional flooding associated with tropical cyclones is increasing. Next slide, please. So when, when, we, uh, when we will be able to limit global warming to 1.5 degree, the risk of this increase in heavy precipitation events is, of course, limited compared to two degrees. In addition to what we have not said here is that the areas where extreme weather situations have not been experienced until now could change. So it might happen that in areas where no one is prepared, a heavy storm event or a flood event or a drought or a heat wave event might occur. And this is something which is not really known until today, but of course the risk for this is there. Next slide, please. So in addition, we, I would like to mention the, um, the, the statement on the increases in runoff as well as those affected by flood hazards. We have heard about flooding before. And I would like to come back to the comment from Costa Rica this morning where she mentioned that um, it, is, that it is not only the um, the, the rain amount, which, which is important, which falls in a tropical cyclone, but there are also weather storm events, which are not categorized as, as, um, as hurricanes, for example, uh, who have a longer lasting time period with medium strong rain, which also causes flooding. So it, we are focusing in the report a lot because of the underlying literature on what uh, we know about extreme weather and climate events, but also those who are not as extreme as the others might cause need for preparedness. Next slide, please. We already talked about the in, uh, reduction of the probability of, um, of droughts and risk associated with water availability if we limit to 1.5 degree. Next slide, please. I would like to mention here the multiple compound um, events which also hit, for example, small islands and coastal and low-lying areas where associated with sea level rise and changes in storminess and in flooding uh, infrastructure, critical infrastructure and human uh, settlements and uh, Deborah talked about coastal cities are at risk. Next slide, please. The terrestrial and wetland ecosystems are at risk under 1.5 degree but less then they would be under two degree. And they are already, we already see changes in many of those species. Next slide, please. The constraining global warming to 1.5 rather than two degree and higher has, of course, strong benefits for the terrestrial and wetland ecosystems and the preservation of their services to humans. Next slide. Land water, land use, food security, and food production systems. I think this is a very important topic. Um, Valerie talked about this already, so the climate impacts 
should be as strongly reduced as possible on crop yield and nutritional content. In some of the regions, we see there are changes already ongoing. Next slide. The risk for food shortages are lower in the Sahel, Southern Africa, the Mediterranean, Central Europe, and the Amazon at 1.5, compared to 2 degree. I think here we have some regions which we already picked up before, so those need specific focus. Next slide. An increase of global warming will, of course, also affect human health, and Miles also mentioned this and particularly in urban areas, of course, due to the heat island effects. This actually will also impact on, um, on work conditions, working conditions, and on, on um, uh, I would say, on labor. So I think this is something which has not been uh, mentioned so much yet. Next slide. Poverty and disadvantage have increased with recent warming. We could see this already, it's demonstrated and mentioned in the report, and are expected to increase in many populations as average global warming increases. And I think this is pretty much where we are. The next slide. Ah, the last one. I would like to mention the key economic sectors and services, which of course face lots of challenges now with the transitions ahead of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniela. And someone from the floor has made a request that these slides be made available to you. So I'll just pass that along to the organizers and we can update you later on how to access them. Um, I'm, I'm going to turn very briefly now to Dr. Martin van Alst, who is the director of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Climate Center, for his reflections on what, as humanitarians, you take away from the science. And then hear from you, and there are a number of very good questions um, coming through on Mentimeter. So we'll try to cover as much ground as we can, but we, we don't have that much time. So if we can hear some quick takeaways, Martin, and then we'll go to the floor. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be brief. And I think we, we've had such an excellent expose already. I don't need to make the case how this is relevant for us. I think the most important that this is no longer an environmental problem for the far future. This is here and now. It is affecting our work today. Uh, we heard the stories from humanitarian practitioners, but I think the science is very clear. Um, in terms of what that means for us, also in terms of this interface, I think it is very important that we have dialogues like the one we have today, and we need more of that. But there's also real work to do for us. One challenge that I think it's been getting slightly better, but we still have a lot of work to do, our humanitarian realities are very difficult to assess in a report like this, because so little of it gets formally documented. Um, we sometimes have things in our appeals documents or so, but very little of it gets properly scientifically written down or even published in a peer-reviewed literature. We can deal with some great literature, but we really need to make a better effort documenting what we are seeing on the ground in a way that can find its way into these global risk assessments. And I think you, you heard Miles's plea, um, I think in the context of the, the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, similar efforts are underway to get much more systematic monitoring of uh, the impact of extremes in particular. In addition, um, if you look at the knowledge gaps that the IPCC still faces, the most vulnerable places have the poorest science. So this is a plea for investment in scientists from developing countries, in the science in those places, all the way from the natural sciences. We actually, from the Red Cross side, commissioned some of the first research on changing extremes in Africa. And it turned out most of the models are really poor there, but people didn't even know because no one had actually really properly looked at those models for those regions. Again, that has changed over time, but much more is needed and more capacity is needed in those regions. From the natural science, especially also to the impacts, and that includes the humanitarian community documenting those impacts properly. And then there's messages for our own work. Given these science gaps, we are facing increases in extremes, but also increases in, in uncertainty. Uh, and I think this links very strongly to the plea also we heard from Mr. Felton from, from the German government earlier this morning, getting better, anticipating extremes over time, um, also acting on shorter term early warnings, um, adapting our humanitarian financing systems for that. And very importantly, um, taking these stories to the local level, where that level of uncertainty is even higher. Very little of the conclusions that you just found about you know, how there's a difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees or what we already know about extremes today can be taken to the scale of a, a single village where people are asking, so what do I do about my risks? 
Yet we know what these patterns of risk mean in a humanitarian context. That is the humanitarian work every day. So we can play a very important role translating that science to what actually needs to be done very practically in terms of risk management at that local scale. And finally, I think we need to be ambassadors. Um, people, and I think there's a couple of real ambassadors in the room, in the room but this is in, a, in, a, in the sense of uh, telling these stories um, beyond this hall. When I tell that I work on climate change in the Red Cross, people still look at me puzzled sometimes. And they think climate change is something either for scientists or for organizations like Greenpeace or, or World Wildlife Fund. And it's still critical that we hear those voices, but we actually should be among the ones most concerned and telling these stories to the rest of the world. And some of the stories, um, Miles was referring quickly to attribution of extremes, you know, doing the science on an individual event that hurts us now, contextualizing what we know about the natural science, how that is changing. Hurricane Harvey last year, the amount of rainfall dumped on Houston that caused so many, um, uh, so, so many losses, but also affected so many people there, three times more likely due to climate change today. If we can generate those numbers, combine it with the impacts that it's having on the ground, and tell that story, I think we have a role to play also generating the action that is clearly needed based on the findings in this report. Thank you, Martin, and implications for us in the media as well in, in that message. So I wanted to get a few reactions from the floor in the same way that Martin has just kind of reflected on what are the takeaways for the humanitarian community. Are there any of you who have had kind of aha moments about takeaways for this sector or have um, thoughts that the, that the science community should take into account um, as we move forward in trying to create this dialogue? Dylan from the UK. Great, thanks very much, and uh, thank you for the organisers, because I think this is a, a really important event, and we should definitely continue this, this dialogue. One thing that hasn't really come up in your discussions is the whole context of fragile and conflict-affected states. And if you look, for example, at where the UK government is focusing its odour, it's majoritively in those areas. If you look where extreme poverty will be by 2030, it's majoritively in those areas. We know we want to see uh, much better preparedness plans, we want to see costed, we want to see early action, we want to see risk mitigation and management, but I guess the question to you is, w what can we do in these sort of places where we don't necessarily have functioning governments, where we don't have the authorities that you've been talking about working with, how can we share data more globally so we better understand the risk in these areas, and what are the tools that we can start to collectively work with to, to really support those people who will be in that, that kind of situation by 2030? Thank you. Other comments and reactions from the floor before we take, come back to the panel? And I will just throw in a couple of the themes that have emerged from the Mentimeter as well that perhaps you can touch on as you respond to Dylan's question. Um, one of them is around human rights, and that has come up actually in a number of different ways. But what does the report tell us about um, how human rights can inform climate ambition? Uh, but also the human rights implications of climate change, which are recognized in the report, such as the right to food. How can human rights law be used to find solutions to the humanitarian implications of climate change? But finally, um, how do we raise enough attention about, uh, sorry, I've jumped off to a different question now, um, but the uh, negative implications on human rights of some of what we're talking about today. So the intersection with human rights was one theme. The other was around displacement, which maybe links a little bit to, um, to thank you, uh, Dylan's point, but that when we did the word cloud earlier today, displacement was the biggest word coming up from the room, and yet it hasn't really been part of the discussions here, and maybe that's simply because it's not one of the scientific uh, impacts, but a, a follow-on impact, but how does displacement fit into this picture? And I think Nepal had its flag up, so I will also turn to Nepal for a comment before we come back. I can't see. Oh, there you are. Thank you, Madam Moderator, for the roar. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to all the distinguished panelists for the very ex excellent and insightful and scientific presentation, a very uh, convincing indeed. And uh, well, uh, coming from a high mountain country, uh, well, my concern is, uh, well, why it is not getting uh, the attention it deserves? Uh, the mountains are getting shamelessly nude. 
and uh, well, it has a lot of impacts in the downstream areas. And uh, there is also, you know, the sea level rise because of all these uh, melting of snow and ice. Um, well, you know, their population might be less in the mountains, but you know, these are uh, well, the implications are tremendous, I believe. And uh, well, I think uh, the mountains do also deserve the equal attention. Thank you. Great, so I'm gonna turn back to the panel now with a few kind of high-level themes, um, and you don't all need to touch on each of them, but I think the questions are around conflict-affected states, around the, the place of displacement in this discussion, around uh, the relationship with human rights, high mountain states, and um, what, have I missed something? I'm losing my own mind now. I think that should be enough to keep you guys busy. And then um, I'm going to come back to you for one last uh, round at the end, which is kind of the one, there have been some questions from the floor around what is the one finding of the report that concerns you the most, or what's the one message that they can use to then advocate in convincing states that may be a bit um, slower to act. And then another comment came up around, um, for example, Australia's in environment minister this week rejecting the scientific authority of, of the report. So um, let's save that kind of last concluding round um, for the next round and for now talk about some of the high level themes. So shall I start with you, Valérie? Quite challenging. A few things I would like to share. The fact that the report at the highest level in the summary for policymakers is stressing the importance of education, information, working at community scales, building on local and indigenous knowledge, which is important, especially for areas of extreme poverty. That's one thing. Um, there are elements related to high mountains in the report. Uh, however, I want to stress that we are also preparing another special report for next year on the ocean and the cryosphere and the changing climate. And in that report underway, we have a specific chapter dedicated to high mountains also building on local and indigenous knowledge together with academic knowledge, which is important for these specific areas. And I think uh, the report is stronger than any other IPCC report on the relationships with human rights. And I would like to invite you to read, especially the chapters one and five, that pay specific attention to human rights in the framing of the report and with respect to the climate resilient development pathways that we have mentioned previously. Deborah? Just building on the response around mountains, we will also be pulling mountains through in the main assessment report of Working Group 2. We have a cross-chapter paper which will focus in on mountains, which will update and integrate. So certainly mountains are very much on, on our radar screen. We, we, we don't place value on the world by the number of people. Everywhere is, is equally valuable to us. Um, just coming down to the issue of, of human rights, working in fragile and conflict-ridden states, I think that the big message there to emerge from this assessment is that, as Valerie has indicated, um, is stressed in the report, is the need for us to work intimately at the local level. In a conflict-ridden state where there is no government, the only people one can work with are the local communities. And certainly myself as a practitioner working in South Africa now in formal settlements where government has little or no control, those communities, in fact, are deeply organized. They are very aware of what their challenges are. But our traditional streams of support are not targeted to them. And I think the report is very clear on that, as well as the overall architecture importance of international cooperation, of nation states working together to, towards this global aim. There's the strong emphasis on working at the local level. And Martin indicated that for groups such as the Red Cross and Red Crescent, they don't write things down. Well, why don't they? They are so busy at the local level that it's hard to. That's a very resource intensive level. The moment you begin working with people, you build elements of trust that need to be sustained over the longer term. So it's not a quick in and out. And I think the Red Cross and Red Crescent know this. And so that talks about the redirection of resources, not only channeling in resources via national governments, but making sure that we make resources available at the grassroots level. And I believe one of the earlier panelists um, indicated, and I sat nodding my head, the high transaction costs of getting access to resources. And very often the resources needed at the local level are not large. 
You need catalytic small uh, resources that don't come with high levels of conditionality. So the report, the 1.5 report, opens up that conversation, but remember we were limited by literature on 1.5. We will see, and you can look at the outlines of the main assessment report, we'll be delving much more into those issues in our main assessment report. But for me, the big message is work at the local level, ensure that's supported and resourced. But know that you're in for the long haul. Local action is not about hit and run. Um, Daniela, very briefly, and then we'll, we'll close with you, Miles. Yeah, I, I, um, I just want to say, the, for answer to the one message, I think the, the other questions have been answered. I think the, for me, the most important is that there's no physical or chemical or technological or financial limit. The only problem is the political will to limit to 1.5. And we have seen impacts all over the world with warming until now, and we see risks all over the world for all systems and all areas of the world up to 1.5 and even worse to 2. So we know what is ahead of us. We know we will live through such a period with 1.5 degree, even if we continue to rise warming, and it will be more than one century for us. So I think it's very important uh, that it is the political will which is needed. Should we just go into the final round? Yeah, I, um, thank you. That was a helpful transition, Daniela. Um, if there's anything else you need to address from before, but really what's the one thing that you find most concerning or the one message that you would transmit? Um, sure. Well, just, just to emphasize, when you're arguing with your Australian minister or whoever it is that you're, you're talking to, um, it, one of the things for, as a physical climate scientist that actually 1.5 degrees made it easier for us in the sense that you don't particularly need a climate model to say if you're aiming to limit warming to 1.5 degrees and you're now at 1 degree and warming at 0.2 degrees per decade, you don't have very much time to turn it around. It, that's not a result from a model. It's, not a, it's, just, it's, it's a result from simple geometry. Um, and, and that's something to really press that, because you know, people love to pick on, oh, the models are wrong, or they, got, they get this and that and the other wrong. It, it doesn't matter anymore. When we were talking about you know, predicting 2100 under three or four degrees, you know, there were many pathways there, many uncertainties in it, much uncertainty in what, was going to, what it was going to be required to, to achieve it. There's, there's much less uncertainty about what we need to do to achieve 1.5 degrees because all of the time scales are so foreshortened, it's all gonna happen in the next few decades. That's, that's the main message to get across to people is you know, in, the, in the lifetime uh, of, of my children, and possibly even in my lifetime, it'll become fairly obvious whether we've done this or not. We don't have time to, it, it's no longer just a matter of, you know, modeling the far future. Thank you very much. I think that's a great note to end it on. If you don't mind, ladies, I'm going to let you share your one messages with the group over lunch, and we're going to move on to the next panel in the interest of time. So thank you very much to all of the speakers and for your questions. I'm going to ask our uh, next two speakers, um, Dr. Jean-Pierre Buiteau and uh, Wael Maidan, to come on stage. And we're going to do a sharp turn now from science to emotion, in a sense. Um, and this will be a rather short session, really just to bring us back to um, ground realities. And then we'll break for lunch um, well before 1 o'clock. So uh, bear with us for a few more minutes. Hi. Please. Hi, Wael. <laughs> So we're aiming in this session to really um, remind us of the lived experience of climate change. And we've heard over and over this morning of the importance of starting to document some of the humanitarian implications. And I'll ask you guys just to Bring your focus back to our lovely, wonderful new speakers. Thank you. So they are here to help paint some of that picture for us. Um, to my right is uh, Dr. Jean-Pierre Guiteau, president of the Haitian Red Cross, a position he's held since 2005. Before that, he served as executive director of the Red Cross and worked for a number of government ministries um, in various technical and advisory roles. 
Um, and to my left is Wa'il Muhammadan, the executive director of CAN International, the largest network of international and national NGOs working on climate change with offices in 20 countries around the world. He's also a, an expert advisor to the Climate Vulnerable Forum that you heard about earlier. So uh, Jean-Pierre, I wanted to, to start with you and, and again, just to help bring this down to earth for us, what are you seeing at the Haitian level in terms of first-hand experience of climate change, um, but also what are you uh, as a national society trying to do about it at the local level? Thank you. Voilà. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk uh, to you and uh, to the assistants regarding the issue of uh, climate change in Haiti. As you know, most of the time Haiti has come back to the focus uh, because of the last week earthquake that hit the country. And uh, as you know, in 2010, we had another quake. So Haiti is from time to time hit by natural disaster. And uh, it's hard for me to select one disaster and say that's specific to Haiti, because we've been from hurricane to earthquake, so it's like a sample of what is bad for a country. And whenever we are dealing with hurricanes, that's a country after the hurricanes that is being flooded. If you remember in 2005, we had that uh, hurricane Jane that killed almost 3,000 people in one geographical department of the country. Sometimes the, the, the history is very bad for the country. And if you go back to the earthquake, we have more than 300,000 people that was killed. Uh, talking about disaster, talking about disaster in Haiti, it's always a bad dream for us. If I go to the, to the, to the last week event that happened to the country, it happened in a place where you already have um, the effect of climate change. They call that place the Far West because it's like a desert. It's like that old, those old movies when you have desert, you have bare, bare hills, things like that. And that's the place that was hit by the, by the quake last week. So it's adding insult to misery. That's, that's the picture that I'm having, uh, the effect of climate change. That's where you see kids uh, mostly uh, we have our access to no, families not having access to food. That you have, you have bare, uh, barely uh, agricultural resources for those people. And if I look at the last result of the IPCC studies, that the news sounds very grim for that country. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Uh, uh, turn to you. We heard a question earlier about the impact of climate change in conflict-affected um, countries. You come from Lebanon. You actually were the lead negotiator for the climate talks on behalf of the Lebanese government and so have a, a good regional picture as well as some of your international work. Can you speak to us a little bit about the impact in some of uh, the areas of the Middle East that are most affected also by other dynamics, um, including conflict? Sure, that's a very interesting question. First, thank you for this opportunity. Hello, everyone. I think this is where I get a bit underwhelmed when I hear the uh, scientific and physical impacts of climate change in relation to, because it, it for me, it doesn't give a full picture actually what climate change is about. Uh, there is no clear geopolitical analysis of how all these natural impacts combine together and how it um, the, you know, impacts economies and political geopolitical uh, picture. For, for us, uh, climate change is an existential issue. Uh, of course, physical scientists cannot put it this blunt, but we, know, we don't know how geopolitically the different impacts work together. And there, we've heard the reports, we've heard uh, experts talking, saying this could trigger World War III. Nicholas Stern, the lead uh, economist uh, in the UK, says that climate change impact is bigger than the First World War, World War Second World War, War, and the Great De uh, Depression combined. I mean, this is the kind of thing that climate change is. I think we need to move from the physical uh, analysis of climate change impacts and have a bigger geopolitical analysis because I don't think everyone understand what we are, what we are facing fully. Uh, uh, one of the Nordic countries, I think it was Sweden, uh, were thinking of changing the name of the climate change ministry to the Ministry of Existence. This is it's an existential problem. It's not an environmental problem. It's not a human rights problem. It's all of them. It's a developmental, it's economic, it's geopolitical, and so on. We have to absorb this because you know people say, is it worth it, all these acts? 
it says it's we're trying to make sure that it is economically viable. And science tells us it's economically viable. But the impacts, even if it wasn't economically viable, the impacts are too much to bear. And we need to understand this. And it does require a response similar to a state of war, where we need to completely shift the way our economy works, shift the way our industry works, and have a complete shift of global economy. There are some research. Uh, geopolitical research done on climate change impacts in the region, in my region, the Arab region. Uh, there are, are some evidence that it contributed to the Syrian conflict, also in the Horn of Africa. But again, I think we need a much more holistic uh, analy geopolitical analysis to see how it can play in the future. If we combine all these natural impacts and how it translates to the geopolitics, I think this is very needed because I think this is what talks more to governments, how it will affect their regimes. We've heard it's a political problem. The economy is on our side. The uh, uh, possibility to do it is on our side. As mentioned, the problem is political will. Um, even in, if you look at our existing champions, they are being hammered for taking action on climate change. The elections in Canada, uh, President Trudeau is, you know, is finding difficulty to implement the carbon tax that was passed. Uh, we see Chancellor Merkel being less, m m very quiet on climate change recently because of the challenges uh, she's facing. And the, she was our main champion. But now with the coalition challenges, you know, Europe is not step stepping forward. Uh, just the recent council announcement, they did not commit to enhancing their uh, NDC uh, as a European Union. Um, so we have a crisis of leadership. On the positive side, we are seeing actions and leadership from elsewhere, from businesses, from cities, from states, uh, from various other actors. But although this is good, um, it is, uh, it's still, we need still uh, the political leadership to happen. We have a lot of good signs. I, I know this session is about the future and good signs as well. Um, if you look at the Arab Spring, so going back to my region, if you ask five minutes any person on the streets in Cairo, do you think there's a chance for Mubarak regime to be moved or changed? Five minutes before the revolution started, no one would have said that it's in any way possible. Five minutes later, it was a reality. And now we see a lot of signs happening of change, of the, that the world is ready for transformation. Every day, there's something new happening. Another country committing to go fully electric vehicles by 2030 or something like that. Five years ago, what's happened in the, in the electric uh, transportation sector, no one would have imagined. It's happening. The transformation is happening. I really believe that we will fully decarbonize the transport sector by 2030. Uh, we see also a lot of uh, signs happening in relation to renewable energy, the change in, uh, in prices. And the champions now, it's not only environmental movement. We have the Vatican on our side. We have uh, so religious leaders. We have trade union leaders uh, stepping forward, uh, and so on. I, I cannot count them all. And the signs are really strong. And any moment, we can wake up for a new transformation. But we cannot stop pushing. We need to continue pushing all of us very strongly uh, to make it happen. And we need to challenge our leaders. That's why we're supporting the Climate Vulnerable Forum, who's taking great leadership politically and challenging all big countries, especially in the upcoming summit on November 22. Thank you. So Wells outlining the need for uh, global leadership. Uh, Jean-Pierre, at the local level, and one of the findings of the report is that adaptation measures really need to be adapted to the local context. What are some of the local solutions that you and others are doing on the ground um, that, that others might learn from? We are bringing the messages to local communities, having our volunteers working with uh, grassroots organizations. And since our volunteers, they are coming from the community, we are, we are sure that they will be able to talk to the community. Uh, we, see, as a medical doctor, sometimes I have to think that if we go back to our reading, uh, if, you, if, you, if you think about what uh, Mr. Um, Alvin Toffler said, if we are dealing with that kind of weather and those climate change, climate increase, I'm sure we may be heading for what he called uh, uh, the shock the future, the future shock. 
That means we may have different individuals in a very short period of time. So we need to make sure that we are preparing the communities to face the reality they are going to change. Like uh, I can tell you, for example, we've been, with the support of partners, we've been able to work together, having local committees, chapters, local chapters of the Red Cross, going house to house and explaining things to families or going to school, educate kids. This, those are good opportunities that we had to make sure that the community understand what we are doing. And recently, not too long ago, we've signed an, uh, an agreement with uh, the government a uh, memorandum of understanding that will allow the Red Cross to go there and uh, to educate kids, to educate communities, and we have the support of the government for that. I believe that's a good hit, that's a good uh, mark for us, and we, still, we should continue to do that to make sure that we are bringing the message. This is, this is not a game, this is serious stuff. The things, things, the climate is changing, and things are getting real, it's getting warmer, it's getting, that, that means you will not be able in very close future to water your garden, to water your lawn. So people should be aware of those things and not spoil what they have in terms of scarce available resources. Those are the messages that we are bringing to the people, to the communities at the grassroots level. I want to pull in one of the questions that had come up through the Mentimeter earlier this morning for you, Al, because when we talk about preparing local communities, um, and particularly in your region, the challenge is um, getting that uh, support to people that are in fragile and conflict-affected countries that are, first of all, harder to reach, but second of all, not first in line for climate-related financing. So if you look at the way the financing works, it's, it's states that are accessing most of the climate funds, and in countries that are in conflict, where uh, you're relying on the state to redistribute that financing, um, uh, from what you're seeing on the ground, to, to what extent is that funding actually going to those who need it most or distributed it in a fair way? And, and in that kind of context, how then, what are the entry points for reaching people with climate adaptation in conflict-affected states? Yeah, this is a challenge. It's not only on the people's level, but even in countries like the Arab region, climate change is not on the agenda at all politically. And this is the problem when climate change creates a political issue. The political issue becomes the focus. They don't look at what has contributed to make that issue. It's hard now to talk to governments in the Arab region about climate change. They, they cannot even conceive thinking about it, knowing that most of the fossil fuels are locked in our region and they are central to that discussion. And actually, countries like Saudi Arabia try hard to uh, you know, fight uh, ambitious climate action. And we've seen in the IPCC 1.5 report how much they try to uh, reduce the impact of that report. So there's a, a huge disconnect and it's only the more, and what tells us that the more there's impact of climate change on the political level, the harder it will be to talk politically on climate change. And, and that's why we need the people on board. Um, I don't know how much people, so if we want to get the money to the people or the money to the right place, I, I don't want to stress where that money needs to go because even if you stop a coal power plant in Australia or stop China from doing coal, everyone benefits, including those in the Arab region. Because the, the minute you do more mitigation, less impact happens all over the world, helping everyone. Um, so t for the money to go on the right place, it has to become a priority issue for the people. I don't know how many know that at the moment, none of your children have a future on the long term. People don't know this. It, I, I disagree with the fact that people cannot see uh, future impacts. They cannot feel future impacts. We invest 20 years in the education for our children because they, we know that in 20 years they're gonna, it's going to benefit them. We understand the benefit of long-term investment. I just think that people are not understanding the, clearly what climate change impacts mean for their children. And the minute this under, is understood, people will be on the streets. No politician will be able to be voted in or, or advance in any way if they don't address, address climate change. And this is where our focus should be now to get to these people, awareness and political mobilization. Thank you very much. Quick and, quick and um, lightning round with uh, two people from very different parts of the world but that can just give us windows into some of the complexities but also some of the solutions on the ground and how they apply differently in different regions. So thank you very much to El and to Jean-Pierre. I'm going to quickly turn to Rebecca Riola, who's going to make a quick announcement before lunch about the video art experience.
Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here today for this fantastic dialogue. My name is Rebecca Rivola, and I'm with the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center. I have a question for all of you. I am wondering who here is interested in connecting more with the individuals at the front lines of 1.5 degrees? Anyone? Excellent. That's what I love to see. So the Climate Center has sought to do just that today. We've prepared a climate cafe. So I am wearing this. And we would love for you to come experience this, connect more with individuals, and especially we would love to record your insights to get more of a dialogue going. We would like to meet every single one of you. So I'm going to be heading back up to our room. We're on the third floor in room eight. I'm gonna be going up there right now and I'm happy to escort a group through the labyrinth. And then we will be there throughout the day with the exception of the breakout session. So please do check it out. We'll be going back and forth. And, uh, and please do not miss this. Thank you very much. Thank you. A, much, a much more compelling pitch than I was able to make this morning. So thank you, Rebecca. Uh, we will regroup uh, after lunch in the breakout sessions directly at 1.30. So 